from Sandra Bullock and Miss Congeniality. Can you get a really good shot of the insanity queen? Yeah. Well, I earned it, honey. 25 years of bitching beauty queens, and what do I get? Fired. They steal my life. They steal my beauty pageant. Hey, hey. It is not a beauty pageant. It is a scholarship program. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Small screen, her specialty has been tough as nails powerhouses like attorney Shirley Schmidt on Boston Legal. You both betrayed me and this firm and the client. Jane Spader, you sickened me, both of you. Careful. And finally, who can forget her hilarious turn as Icy Vogue editor Enid Frick on Sex and the City? No one cares about your agenda. That's not true. Oh, forgive me. I don't care about your agenda. I care about designers. Oscar de la Renta, Chanel, Dior. I want less Oscar. Carrie Bradshaw and more carry this bag with these shoes. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> Meanwhile, America fell in love with her all over again in 1988 as the unsinkable Murphy Brown. You spoke personally in his compartment for over an hour. Now you're treading on very dangerous ground, Miss Brown. If you have any evidence of this, you better produce it. Will these do, Judge Ferris? These are pictures of you on that yacht. <laughs> there you are with Mr. Kaminsky chatting on the bridge. You and Mrs. Kaminsky dancing. And isn't that you at the buffet table? <laughs> so please welcome the great Candace Bergen. It was fun for us to put together because you've done so much great work through the years, I'm so Candace. Old. <laughs> no, no, come on, that's not true. Well, you know, I wanted to ask you first of all about your background because you know you're really Hollywood royalty in a lot of ways, and as as people know, at least you know, I followed your career from from really the beginning, and your mom, of course. Francis Bergen, an actress and a model, beautiful Francis Bergen. Your dad, Edgar Bergen, the uh, ventriloquist. Yes. And I know that in your autobiography that you wrote in 1984 called Knock Wood, because I even think I might have interviewed you for that. If not, I, I read think it. So. Um, that that basically you would, your dad would sit with Charlie McCarthy on one knee, his dummy, and you on the other. The and other basically dummy. <laughs> and make, have the two of you talk to one another. Oh, but I I wouldn't talk. He would squeeze my neck. That was the signal to open my mouth. But he would provide the voices for both of us. <laughs> I mean, that must have been a little bit of a strange childhood for you. Was it strange and wonderful or just strange? Every now and then, I, I have to congratulate myself for being a viable human being. <laughs> You and your dad um, made some radio and TV appearances together, and we actually got one no. of you at 11 on Groucho Marx's oh, show, God. You Bet Your Life, in 1958. Let's take oh, a look. Edna, what class did you go to in school? Well, when I got into college, I had a little trouble there. I was in summer school most of the time to get reinstated for the fall term. <laughs> you went as far as college? Yeah. Well, I'll let you handle this by yourself. <laughs> Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? All right, here's number one. Are you ready? Go ahead, Candy. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say that. No. no. <laughs> Do you remember that? I do. Are you I remember nervous? it as if it were yesterday, and I've been trying to buy that tape ever since. <laughs> really? Well, we could probably sell it to you. Thank now. you. <laughs> <laughs> we got a hold of it. Yeah. But was it expected, Candace, that you would go into entertainment given your family background? Because I know for a while you were interested in photography. I, I had forgotten that you were actually offered a job as a correspondent on 60 Minutes at one well, point. Well, of course, that was just crazy that he would have thought to offer me a job. But it, it and the fact that I didn't take it was even crazier. <laughs> except then I wouldn't have gotten to play a journalist on TV, That's which true. was even better. Um, no, I did. I love photography, and I and I whenever I wasn't doing movies, I wouldn't take pictures. But um, then. Then my eyesight started changing, so I shifted. <laughs> and looking at your filmography, preparing <laughs> for this interview, Candace, I looked at some of the leading men 
that you've had the privilege of, of performing with over the years. Steve McQueen, Michael Caine, Anthony Quinn, Sean Connery, Burt Reynolds. I mean, amazing. Yeah. Actors, do you have a favorite among them, or is that a terrible question to ask you? They were all really lions in their field, and Steve McQueen was the first man, man that I worked with, the first lead, and I was just 19, so I didn't even know what to compare him to, but he was, could be so charming and at the same time so turbulent that right. um, it, he was fascinating and, and incredible screen presence, Steve McQueen. But, uh, and Michael Caine is just sure, he's Michael the Caine. eternal Michael Caine. He never stops working. He's so talented um, and so funny. And everybody loves Michael Caine. He comes on the set. He has everyone in his pocket. Then, of course, came Murphy Brown, who really was the quintessential modern woman. And it was great for me because I watched it as I, as I was, you know, had a career, a fledgling career in television news as a local reporter. But she was a no-nonsense working woman. She became a single mom. She battled breast cancer. She was a recovering alcoholic. You know, we're going to talk about the Dan Quayle controversy, which I remember so well a little bit later. But what, did you realize from the get-go, Candace, that she was going to be a real game changer and a conversation starter and much more than just a TV show? No. I, I, all, all any of us knew was that the script was of a level that I, I'd never seen anything that was better written in terms of a comedy. And it was like the, the classic comedies of the 40s. And um, I just would have done anything to be in that, in that role and in that show. And we were all so excited to just to do it every week because the writing was of such a level. Um, but, and then we were working so hard that it was hard to, to gauge the reaction that it was having out in the world because you never got a chance to be there. Well, when we come back, we're going to be talking to the woman behind this woman, the creator of Murphy Brown, Diane English, along with actress Faith Ford. That's right after that. <laughs> Next. Candace, when you went for the audition, they weren't really that excited about you, right? What was it that you saw in Candace that made you think, this is our Murphy? Plus, we have never seen before, from alcoholism to single motherhood, the show never shied away from addressing the issues of the day with humor and heart. The driving force behind Murphy Brown was the show's brilliant creator. Please welcome Murphy alter ego, Diane English. <laughs> saying to Candace, Diane, I remember when you did those Hanes stocking commercials at the height of the Murphy Brown popularity and because you have such beautiful legs. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, and still do. So, so where did the idea for the whole Murphy Brown show come from, Diane? You know, um, I, I was always very conflicted about whether I wanted to write screenplays and plays or whether I wanted to be a journalist. And so I was stuck in traffic on the 405, which, you know, is a way of life in Los Angeles. And I was just sitting there listening to the radio, and it was, I was listening to Aretha Franklin sing Respect. And it, it was one of those moments the universe gives you where this whole show just dropped into my head. Really? And, you know, and by the time I got to the studio, I had every character. I was so excited. It was just one of those things that just sprang out of my, you know, whatever. Oh, so. you love when that happens? Yeah. <laughs> and, and it hasn't happened since. So. <laughs> you know, as we've been saying all along, you know, you were just so courageous in tackling all these cultural, you know, touchstones and, and, and conversation starters, as I mentioned. Was that always important when that kind of dropped into your brain? Did you think, and I want to talk about real things? Oh yeah, because you know, again, I you know, I was I was wanting point in my life to be a journalist, but you know, there wasn't really any political satire on television um, for a very long time, and I thought, well, this is a slot we can fill. Um, and they, the really, the studio let me, the network let me do it, which was surprising because we had taken real positions on things and and I don't think we could have done that today. But they almost didn't let you cast Candace in the role. Candace, when you went for the audition, they weren't really that excited about you, i.e. the network executives, right? Oh no. 
Oh, no. I, I, in fact, they said, okay, thanks for reading. Goodbye. And, and you uh, thought, uh... But they wanted someone much younger. They they wanted. They said, couldn't Murphy be coming back? The, in the pilot, Murphy arrives off the elevator, and they said, couldn't Murphy be coming back from a week at a spa? Does it have to be a month at Betty Ford for alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> we have to be 40. Couldn't she be in her early 30s? And Diane said, are you insane? <laughs> the whole point is her edges. And in fact, for a while there, weren't they thinking, I can't imagine this, but I learned this in preparing for this interview, that they were pushing Heather Locklear, is that true? This, this was a... This no, nothing against Heather Locklear. Locklear. <laughs> no, nothing against... Love she's her. lovely and beautiful and kind, I'm sure. Right. But she's not Murphy Brown. No, Brown. no, no. And so, you know, I, I really had to, to fight for that. You know, and what really saved me was that um, the writer's strike, which lasted for nine months, hit right the day after I turned my script in. Mm. And so I was not able to change a word of it. So that Perfect. was like that. Yeah, it was like, again, divine something or other. But you know. And what was it that you saw in Candace that made you think, this is our Murphy? Well, I thought she actually could be that person in real life, you know, because she had... <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a compliment or not. It is, because I loved my character, you know, and I wanted to be her. And we met in New York. Do you remember I this? Do. Yes. She opened the door. We were wearing the same outfit. <laughs> same lipstick. Same, same lipstick. Same, same perfume. <laughs> And then we read through the script the following day, and it was so obvious to me that she was so perfect for this. She has a very wicked sense of humor and, and had gravitas at the same time. And, and that sort of tough exterior, but kind of soft, soft exterior. <laughs> well, as you mentioned, the show begins with your return from battling alcohol addiction at, at the or, and meanwhile, back at the FYI newsroom, Murphy meets her fill-in and polar opposite the endlessly perky journalist, Murphy <laughs> Sherwood. I hope you're not mad at me, Murphy. No, I'm glad you're going. It'll give me a chance to break into your apartment and set your clothes on fire. <laughs> oh, Murphy, you didn't mean that. Yes, I did. I really did. <laughs> home week here it does is it fun to see everybody do you guys stay in touch closely or just this is how we see each other no. really <laughs> no we should well diane lives in la a lot in new york and you both well, i kind of live in louisiana most of the time when i don't have to be in la or whatever so we don't get to see each other unless i happen to be in one of the places they are and how, how did this change your life and career faith i mean i know you are from alexandria louisiana <laughs> Former Brown. Yes. And but when you got this role and it became such the epicenter of of, uh, of a national conversation and really just a weekly water cooler mm -hmm. chat. I mean, how did it change things for you? Oh, it changed everything. I think I was most nervous about meeting Candace for the first time. You know, she was an icon, a Hollywood. You know, she was Hollywood royalty to me, and she was so beautiful. I'm gonna t give you these compliments because it's very true. <laughs> Y'all all agree with me, right? Yeah. And she, and she still is. And, and I just, all I cared about is that I looked right. So I went in to meet her and it was my audition with Candace and I, and I bought myself a silk suit. <laughs> and I just thought I was very big back then. Yeah. Yeah. And I just said, I've got to look right for her. And I had my, my, my Nina shoes. You remember Nina shoes? <laughs> and I was like, so I just thought it looked so good. Well, we had a monsoon in Burbank that day. And I think I was the only one coming in when it was coming down. And there was like a river on Olive Boulevard in, in, at Warner Brothers. And I literally, I had no choice. But I'm from Louisiana, I just pulled everything up and I just walked on it. <laughs> and uh, hey, he showed them the corky dance. Oh, okay, yeah. And I had to audition and then after it was all over, I went back in the room and I, I did the corky dance. <laughs> <laughs> Girl. We did. We did. She did mm. the most perfect audition left 
and then did what an actor should never do. I want to come back in and I want to show you how Corky yeah. would dance. It could have all gone south at that moment. <laughs> reason it worked, it right? It totally worked. One of my colleagues asked me this morning, was Corky based on you? And I said, just because someone called her Perky, <laughs> don't think she was based on me. It hurts you, doesn't it? <laughs> Perky. Perky. Yeah, yeah, I hate that word. <laughs> Up next, we're going to talk to the men of Murphy Brown and also about that infamous Dan Quayle moment. That's right after this. believe the dust up this started and that Dan Quayle was actually talking about a TV character? This went to the point of this guy really thought she was a real person. Right. <laughs> and later, Katie dishes on her Murphy Brown guest spot. I was so nervous and freaked out. It's all coming up. Real treat today. We're here with Candace Bergen, Faith Ford, and Murphy Brown creator Diane English. It's been 25 years, believe it or not, since Murphy Brown premiered in November of 1988. Over the next decade, fans watched as the FI, FYI news team became a family, a bit of a dysfunctional family. <laughs> if you're going to toy with us, Murphy, there's no point in being here. I'm not toying with you, Jim. It's definite. I'm pregnant. Oh, my God. It's a medical miracle. <laughs> this to you. Please welcome the man of Murphy Brown, Charles Kim, Regal Budo, and Grant Shaw. treat for me to see you guys again and for and I asked Faith is it fun for you all to have the gang assembled once more he said no it, it's, <laughs> we heard that. we're gonna try to repair that yeah we love it it's, it's the, the minute yesterday that we all saw each other everybody just lit up and we have a great time every time we see each other it's remarkable and there's so many episodes that I remember I just have to ask you about this one episode because when I did the Today Show I often thought about you guys do you remember the episode where Something was happening at FYI. They didn't have the tape ready. And the stage manager was saying, stretch, stretch, <laughs> stretch, like for an, a, a ridiculous amount of time and how you guys had to fill that time. It was you. You were so funny. We tried to get that clip and we couldn't find it, but it was hilarious. I mean, do you remember that show? Yes, I do. <laughs> you know, I know you were a very established stage actor, right, when you got this role. I, I thought of myself as a step. <laughs> I had precarious jobs like all actors do. I jumped from job to job. I had a couple of ones that lasted more than a month, a month or two in, in the theater. Yeah. To have the gift of Jim. I don't Diane. I never told Diane how much I loved Jim and how afraid I was of losing him. So, <laughs> don't cry. Please don't cry. <laughs> and as the years have gone on, looking back, when we all get together, it really is powerful, the feelings we have for each other. And I know, Joe, you feel the same way in that you guys have this sort of instant camaraderie. And wh where do you think that came from? How did you, I mean, it's pretty unusual, it seems to me, for, for a whole cast to click like you guys did. Uh, it, it, it is unusual. We sort of, we, we knew who our characters were on day one, which is a credit to Diane. I mean, they were so clearly etched. You never see that in, in a show. It takes a year two years sometimes for these shows to really find out who they are and also uh, you know we were all sort of nervous even though candace doesn't like to hear it she was hollywood you know she lived next to walt disney and i i live next to nikki delucia you know? <laughs> um, so meeting her for the first time and realizing that she was so gung-ho about doing this show and doing it right yeah. and and worked so hard and loved a good joke about her. 
she loved loved to be uh, played with that way. So we we had a ball right from the beginning. And and Grant, of course, she played the neurotic executive producer of <laughs> FYI, Miles Silverberg. And I couldn't believe I you know I knew you were young when you did this show, but you were only 27 years old when when you were cast as Miles. I was. I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> and, and did you have any would be this successful? Naive. Because yeah. uh, I had no context uh, as to what it takes to just even get a pilot bought and on the air. I had no context. So I was like, the writing's amazing. We've got Candace Bergen. We're, we're good. <laughs> and, you know, Joe would always be like, quiet. Don't talk. Don't yeah. talk. The two of them, it was ridiculous. They thought just because it was good, it was going to go on for a long time. Was he crazy? Yeah. Well, I thought it was, it was so good because it was so... Funny, but also incredibly smart, and it became known from it for its rip from the headlines plot. And in 1992, the tables were turned on Murphy Brown in a televised speech. Vice President Dan Quayle criticized Murphy for choosing to become a single mother. Let's take a look. It doesn't help matters when primetime TV has Murphy Brown, a character who supposedly epitomizes today's intelligent, highly paid professional woman, mocking the importance of fathers by bearing a child alone and calling it just another lifestyle choice. But, but, Dan Quayle did not have the last word. Perhaps it's time for the vice president to expand his definition and recognize that whether by choice or circumstance, families come in all shapes and sizes. Because I, on the Today Show, I was talking about Dan Quayle and Murphy Brown. Could you believe the dust-up this, this started and that Dan Quayle was actually talking about a TV character like this? No, my goal had always been to, to blur the line between fiction and non-fiction. But this went to the point of, <laughs> you know, this guy really thought she was a real person. And so... You know, when all this happened, I got a call from Candace. I was in L.A., she was in New York, and she, it was the following day after the speech, and, and she said, have you seen the New York Times yet this morning? And I said, no, it's like 6 o'clock in the morning here. And she said, go down your driveway and get that paper. And there, above the fold in the New York Times, the lead on story the front on the front page was a picture of her holding the baby and then Dan Quayle's quote, and it just went on from there. You know, it might, have been a, it might have been a TV show, but I mean, I think it's a tribute to you because you had your finger on the pulse of a cultural trend that was happening in society. And, and for you, Candace, was it surreal? I mean, what did you make of this whole thing? I was so overwhelmed. I, I had gone to Philadelphia to my old university and I came back and I walked into the lobby of my building and there was a New York Post that, that said Murphy has baby quail has cow was the headline <laughs> <laughs> and then the New York Daily News which was quail to Murphy you slut so I thought what is happening and, um, and I just put my head under I just burrowed under and let Diane take I just had nothing but to it, do with it it was such an interesting intersection of, of television and culture that just in that yeah. moment and uh, you know by the way I want to mention that we're missing someone from the cast here at this reunion and that that's Robert Pastorelli who played Eldon the painter and he died uh, in 2004 of a drug overdose which was such a tragedy um, and you of course spent a lot of time with Eldon in the show at you know at your apartment Eldon was I think many people's favorite character because so many people have had a painter who, who just stayed for years and <laughs> never finished the job and Bobby was such a resourceful weird actor that he would find moments that other actors wouldn't and and he was such a uh, such a larger than life guy in real life that um yeah he was very lovable he well, was great i know you all are thinking about him as you guys get together once again oh he Always. was a remarkable just hilarious guy just disarming we, we love bobby yeah well when we come back we're gonna have more with the cast of murphy brown that's right after that <laughs> Come. 
Eva Longoria has a new man in her life. And how did you two hook up? How she's teaming up with the philanthropist Howard Buffett to fight hunger. So many of us feel powerless to do anything. These stories in here are about some ordinary people who did extraordinary things.